anyone who saw the sea of people, um, estimated at half a million people, flood the, the streets of London on uh, the 28th, um, amidst a very important point, and that is that week upon week, the numbers double. And that's saying something. Usually, you know, you, you start big. People are moved by events, they're shocked and the such, so it's big, and then the numbers start to dwindle. That's how things naturally occur. But what has happened over the three Saturdays here in London is that we started with around 100, 120,000, then it was 250,000, then it's half a million. And, you know, who knows? Maybe it will come to having another million march uh, here in London. What do you think the reasons are? And obviously, I'm, I'm guessing that the shocking images and uh, the probably government failure to deal with that and to respond to people's outrage. But how, how, how does this happen? I think um, you have to reach back to the mobilizations over the Iraq war. And, and these are the first time, these mobilizations are the first time since then mm. that we've had this kind of intensity of mobilization and continuously these kind of numbers. Um, and I think that that series of demonstrations in 2003 um, fundamentally altered the perception of politics, international politics, politics in the Middle East, um, by mil for millions of people uh, in this in this country. Of course, um, Palestine was one of the slogans on that Iraq war uh, demonstration, and I think that turned into a kind of settled opinion. Mm. And I think that despite the enormous kind of onslaught on the idea of Palestinian solidarity um, for the purposes of trying to uh, dislodge Jeremy Corbyn as leader of the Labour Party, that's remained. In fact, if you think back to 2021, then there was a demonstration of quarter of a million for yes. Palestine Correct. then. So I think this is a, a settled opinion mm. for millions of people. And I think they react um, to each new crisis um, by manifestations, huge manifestations of support. And I think that's exactly what we're seeing. And week on week, week, week yes. on week. And yeah. people are telling others and people are encouraging others. And more and more people are, uh, are you know, believing in the necessity for this. And, you know, despite the weather, despite... Despite, let's say, I mean, the thinly veiled threats by the Home Secretary that people will be arrested for, you know, any kind of manifestation of support for Palestine or for the Palestinian people or such, and they will be interpreted in a particular way to absolutely show that that is a support of a terrorist organization and the such. Yet, people are defying all that. They're carrying more flags. They're, they're, they're even louder in chanting particular chants. And, and they're getting more and more involved. And I, whenever I go back to those, you know, those days of magnificent, you know, protests, um, the two million march in February of 2003, despite the fact that it, you know, didn't stop the war happening. But as you put it, I, I still speak to people who come up to me and say that it, it was their political awakening. It was then that they understood and realized and appreciated that despite the official stand of governments, that the people are of a very clear and unequivocal moral compass. When I remember those days, and you and I were on the stage, looking onto an endless sea of, uh, of, of people, uh, stretching from Hyde Park all the way back to Embankment, if you recall, mm. and the most incredible thing about that were the, the diversity, were the fact that people were of all colors, of all backgrounds, of all, you know, all sorts of banners were, were raised, all sorts of flags, all sorts of 
chance and the such. And that, that is telling. And I, I believe we're seeing that once again. Yeah, I agree. I, I think these are the most diverse Palestine solidarity marches mm. um, that, we've, uh, that we've had. And again, I think this is a cumulative thing. You know, in official politics... Mm. Uh, tradition is carried by stable institutions, myriads of, you know, civil servants working away to make sure that we all understand the long levity of the monarchy or the importance of Poppy Day or whatever it might might be there. There's institutionalised memory. Yeah. But um, in protest movements, there's no institutionalised uh, memory. It's a current which flows sometimes in the open and sometimes underground. Uh, I think we've managed to sustain, uh, you know, far longer than I'm sure either you or I thought at the time, certain organisations like the Stop the War Coalition and obviously the Palestine Solidarity Campaign and CND, these are long-lasting organisations and just as well because they are central now as they were uh, as they were then and they have a continuity, they have a, a memory of how things are done, uh, they have a political inheritance about what's worked and what hasn't in the past. They have a, a cadre which are experienced from the last time to come and inform a new generation or help a new generation learn from a new generation as well. Um, and I think all those things are important. And nevertheless, it's a sometimes hidden, sometimes open continuity, but it's real. Mm. And that's what you're seeing. And you could see the surprise that the establishment had. I, I believe, I, you know, for all that we faced over the Iraq war, and there was lots of, you know, absolute nonsense tried by the government then, people may remember, a, a, a tank put outside Heathrow Airport for absolutely no purpose whatsoever other than to try and intimidate the marchers. We were told on one march by the Metropolitan Police there was definitely going to be a bomber yeah. on the march. Yeah. And we had to decide... Are you going to go ahead with this in the in? And we thought you guys are gaslighting us, mm. and we went ahead, and nothing happened. Yeah. As those were serious, but this Home Secretary is clearly absolutely bonkers. Yeah, um, and, you know she sprang onto Twitter like the most rabid troll to try and troll half a million people. It's amazing, uh, and to and to talk of them as if they were to talk of them. Literally, I mean, there's a lot in the debate in the Middle East about the inappropriateness of using analogies with the Second World War. And by and large, I think they're important points. Yeah. But she is doing that. Yeah. She is saying, you people are like fascists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, which, is, which is absolutely incredible. I mean, even police chiefs, they're now talking a very reasonable language in response to her. They're yeah. saying, listen, you know, we can't go around arresting people for raising flags or for making chants or the or for expressing their views. This is a this is a free country, or as 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 much as we 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 know and appreciate, it is a free country. But it's um, it's telling and probably one of the reasons why we're having the numbers, at least uh, from, from where I'm standing, is the fact that uh, people feel bereft politically. They feel that there is no representation. Mm. They are not, I mean, and, and I'm talking here across the board. I mean, even the traditional protesters, those who take direct civil action, um, trade unions and the such, who would, even during Iraq, were very closely affiliated and very, you know, organically linked to the Labour Party, you feel that there's, there's not that anymore. Yeah. That once again, we're seeing, we're seeing another version of um, the Tony Blair regime, but one that is vacuous, mm. one that is simply seeking power and almost salivating at the prospect that, come the next general elections, the Tories have had it, the country's sick and tired of them and their policies and their failures. And it's as though they're trying to prove themselves to someone, somewhere, way ahead of time. It's, uh, I, I feel that that is definitely part of why people are turning up and why they're angry. Yes, uh, and I, I think, <clears throat> you know, we, we've got on a political establishment which has exhausted its options in terms of being able to actually alter the lives of the majority of the population in, in, yeah. in the country. You know, whatever we thought of Thatcherism, 
there was some genuine belief and some genuine belief among working people that you could buy your council house, mm. buy shares in British gas. Uh, we've now all lived through the practical results of that yeah. and literally nobody in the country or very few people in the country believe that stuff anymore. Mm. We went through the Tony Blair version of this, a kind of social democratic version of Thatcherism and that hasn't improved the health service. It hasn't improved, you know, the most common thing you hear in the country now, you stand in a bus queue, you get on a train, you go into a bar. What do people say? They say, Britain is broken. Yeah. Nothing works. Yeah. The only thing that works is Amazon on the basis of slave labour. That's the only thing that works. The health service doesn't work. The education service doesn't work. The housing situation is terrible. And on and on about key institutions in um, British political life. And the establishment doesn't have an answer to that. You know, it has pretend answers. Mm -hmm. The sort of Boris Johnson, you know, clown show, you know, answer. The You know, we'll capture the, the you know, we'll push down the red wall and the Keir Starmer will just copy the Tories. And, and nobody really believes that stuff anymore. You know, you've got a broken political establishment, I think. And uh, another... <clears throat> element or characteristic of these massive protests uh, is, and this, this at least uh, to me, and I'm pretty sure you join me in this, is that so many young people, and we're talking here about students, about young professionals, about children, about, you know, people are engaged. People yeah. are, um, they want to be seen. They want to be heard. And that's something which, uh, which, which I see as, as, as something that, that will create a change, that it has the potential to create a change. People, at least from the discussions that I'm hearing and the discussions I'm involved with, uh, people are tired. Mm. People don't see that there is a solution proposed by any of the political parties. And whilst this is tragic in terms of the political stagnation or the bottleneck that we're in right now and the lack of any kind of resolve to people's, you know, the cost of living crisis, the eruption in numbers of food banks, the, the fact that more and more people are around, hovering around the poverty line, the more children are unable to, to get a nutritious meal, you know, more than once a week or probably even less. All of these issues are without resolution. And then comes something as momentous as what's happening in Gaza, a war crime being committed before our very eyes. We read about it in, in history books. We never thought we would be witness to, 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 to war crimes being committed. And people see that this failure, this political failure is compound it's multi-layered it's not just local it's on every single level yeah i i think uh, i think what's happening here you know I mean, obviously people are you know there's a layer of people in the society who understand the politics mm. involved here and they got that a lot from the iraq war protests and they, they felt informed in a way that perhaps they never had done before about the politics of the whole of the whole region there's that going on but I think at an absolutely mass level, at the level of the 76% of the population who say there should be an immediate ceasefire in that YouGov poll, at that, that level, I think they see in the Palestinians um, people who are being treated completely unjustly, mm. completely wrongly. Mm. And it's an emotional reaction to watching people being bullied in a kind of ultimately fatal way. And I think that's what people are reacting to. And they react like that because they feel in their own sort of way that in their lives, they too are being pushed around unjustly mm. and treated with contempt. Mm. And I think you saw that, I think the moment you saw that begin to alter actually was during COVID. Yeah. Because when the clap for carers happened, yeah. Now, the government later tried to appropriate that, but the first few weeks it happened, it was an entirely grassroots thing. Correct. And you saw probably the only mass expression of politics bigger than the Iraq war 
was that literally millions of people went onto their doorsteps yeah. to clap other working people. Yeah. So these are people who have been told for at least since Thatcher mm. that they were useless chavs, dispensable, didn't need to be paid properly, didn't need to work with a union or have proper conditions. Suddenly they're essential workers, key workers. And it altered the moral understanding of what ordinary people are and of their own sense of their value in this It forced society. the government to admit that society couldn't function without these people. Yeah. They were not only cogs in a big machine, they were the machine. Yeah. And, and I think that's what they see in the Palestinians. <clears throat> that there's, there's some... I don't think anybody quite articulates it that way, but I'm convinced there's a... When we chant, we are all Palestinians, yeah. we mean we're sympathetic. I think for lots of people, they feel... That's bad. Mm. You know, that is so bad. Yeah. And things like that. Not the same, not as awful, yeah. but they happened to me. Yeah. Yeah. Being downtrodden, being mm. deemed irrelevant, being mere numbers rather than actual human beings um, with something to say. How, I mean, you mentioned a little bit earlier, you mentioned the, the, the campaign to. Uh, a very organized, very intense campaign to uh, root out not only Jeremy Corbyn, but anyone who sympathized and stood and supported Jeremy mm. Corbyn that went on for years, you know, during his leadership and then obviously more intensely after, um, after he left, after he was deposed. Um, and that campaign, which carries on till now, anyone who speaks in a particular way the charge of anti-Semitism is there, is, is always ready for whoever um, as any kind of, you know, support for the Palestinians, for instance, for any kind of campaign or sympathy um, expressed for, for, for the Palestinians. Yet, um, that is being challenged, and that's being challenged by not only the numbers, of, uh, of people who are showing up in these demonstrations, but also in terms of the resignations submitted to the Labour Party, saying that this is not on, this is unacceptable. The fact that Keir Starmer could appear on several mainstream medias, himself a human rights lawyer, um, a former att attorney general or pro public prosecutor, and speak in a language that a first year GCSE law student would recognize is absolutely absurd and egg Israel towards committing war crimes. Uh, in addition to all of this, um, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're also seeing an, a, a shift in narrative. People are becoming uh, more, uh, more adapt, uh, you know, more, in, uh, I don't know, aware of how to respond to the charge. I, I, think, I think this is a very important thing because, you know, when I and, first... And by the way, if I may, may just mm. add before you, and, and this, and this um, is with full awareness, and this is why I'm interested in this particular thing, full awareness that anti-Semitism is a real issue. Mm. It's a real issue. Mm. And it's a scourge that stains our society. Mm. But it doesn't come from those who, the corners that support the, the right of Palestinians. That's, mm. that, that is the point that I'm trying to make. Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, <laughs> it, it's taken us time to be able to get around this, this use, abuse actually, of anti-racism by the political right. Mm. You know, when I came into politics, you'd have, there were racists. There was Enoch Powell. There was the leaders, John Tyndall, leader of the National front at the time, they were racist, you were anti-racist. But the political establishment in recent times, in the kind of culture war period, have deliberately utilised things which have historically been the province of the left to attack the left. So it's not, I'm a racist, you're an anti-racist, that's the battlefield. It's, I'm an anti-racist, practising racist policies, 
and you're a racist if you oppose me. That's the, that's the structure yeah. of, the, uh, of the argument. And not only that, but we're going to stick um, an Asian prime minister and an Asian home secretary up to tell you that you're a racist if you behave in certain kinds of ways. Now, in a way, that's a kind of tribute to battles that we fought in the past, certainly not battles that they fought in the past. Yeah. In the past, they would have fainted at the thought of having a leader of the of Tory party who was uh, anything but white. But now we've got to unpick that. We've got to say, no, actually, you are abusing that term, you are misusing that term, you are damaging both the people who historically and currently are in the forefront of the fight against actually existing racism, and you are damaging the community that suffers racism in whose name you are accusing us of being racist. Mm. So you are doubly guilty, doubly guilty of practicing exactly the opposite of what you preach. And um, remarkably, uh, amongst the, uh, the hundreds of thousands Millions, if you're to count the commentators on social media and you know everywhere around the country, um, amongst them is the Jewish element, the Jewish communities, the Jewish organisations, young, old, uh, many of them who actually come from Israel, uh, many of them who claim that they, uh, you know, have family, you know, Zionist families, and they. Uh, but the, the kind of language they're adapting, uh, ad adopting is, uh, is, is incredible. Mm. And it's leading to the, you know, the advancement and the promotion of this argument for the case of Palestine, that this is not about Muslims versus Jews. This is not about, you know, Jews be being at uh, the other side, if you wish, of the fence. Actually, Jews are on the right side of mm. history. Mm. And that it's the Israeli government and it's the IDF that is behaving in a manner that, that is nigh on, if not actual war crime. Mm. But, um, and this is, this is a, an incredible shift and an incredible move. Well, there's, t there's two things here. You should never racialize politics. Yeah. You say that uh, <clears throat> a community is this way or that way politically. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there are Tory Muslims Yes. And there are revolutionary socialist Muslims, and there is everything Absolutely. in between, and with the same. And there are Zionist yeah. Muslims, uh, by the way. And the same with Jewish, Absolutely. and the same with Hindus, yeah. and the same, obviously, yeah. with the English. And so it, it may be fair to say a majority of this community think this way. It is never the case that universally every single person in the community thinks this way. What's very interesting, I think, about um, what's happening among uh, the Jewish community now is that. Uh, you're right, the, the, the oldest, longest tradition in the Jewish community is a very powerful, radical tradition. Yeah. Very, very powerful, yeah. radical tradition. Karl Marx was a Jew. Yeah. Leon Trotsky was a Jew. The, two of the, the, the biggest names in radical politics came from that kind of uh, community. And I think what is now happening is that among a minority at the moment they're looking back and discovering that radicalism and saying, no, we always thought that this religion was about peace and equality and we don't recognise that in the state of Israel. And I think it's been long and hard for, you know, many Jewish radicals all the way through the Corbyn years. But the good thing about it is they organised them. They yeah. got organised and they began to fight back and they began to say, no, not in my name. Yes. And that's what we're, and that's now fed into this. Yeah, and it was, the, it was the, the, you know, the various Jewish organisations within the labour movement that actually stood by Jeremy Corbyn mm. against the charge that he was somehow promoting anti-Semitism mm. or that he was failing to root out the scourge of anti-Semitism within the party. Yeah. It was they that said, this is incorrect, this is not true, yeah. this is not the case. So if we were to cast our gazes just a little bit further, how do you see this unfolding? I mean, obviously we'll come to talk about what's happening in Gaza, but what's happening on the streets of the UK 
you know, cities across Europe, across the United States remarkably, filling up New York uh, City, uh, you know, Washington, about, you know, the real bedrocks of where someone like Netanyahu could safely walk the streets and feel that he's at home. Mm. People filling those streets and chanting, um, you know, for freedom for Palestine and mm. for the Palestinians. And uh, how do you see this moving forward? Well, I mean, you know, we've got and a lot- And bear in mind, we do have a government that is still intent on clamping down on protests, clamping down on freedom of speech, on uh, on the such. Ha- yeah, have- I, I, th- I think we've got a lot of road to run and not least on that particular, particular issue. I mean, uh, I, I think there is a, you know, as we were saying earlier, it wasn't that the, the Blair government didn't do some of this stuff, this kind mm-hmm. of scaremongering, but this government's off the leash uh, in terms, they, they, are cl- they clearly want to essentially make protest illegal, mm. at least on this issue, and to make certain expressions and forms of personal expression even um, illegal. Now, I don't know how far they can get with that. Um, and in part, how far they can get with it depends on how we react. Um, and it's always true that war situations are accompanied by attacks on civil liberties at home. We recognize that with the Iraq Iraq war. But this is a fight that we really have to get into and get into with the utmost seriousness. All three of those major demonstrations have had um, legal restrictions placed on them by the police. Yeah. That didn't happen over Restriction Iraq. of routes. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Where Going you can, as far as to issue statements saying that whoever walks a different way or walks, uh, you know, in a different path will be liable to being arrested. Yeah. And there are arrests going on around these um, for organising demonstrations. You know, it's a colleague in, in Scotland has been arrested in his own home just for organising a demonstration. Now, this is very, very serious stuff. And I think we have to, we have to sit down with um, the um, politicians and and I think we have to confront the police about this. I think the, the Met Commissioner cannot go on television and say, predict that he's going to make many arrests, yeah. that he's going to act his words ruthlessly, mm. um, and that he wants the government to define extremism. Now, we've been here with the Prevent programme. Yeah, we have. Uh, that was largely directed at the Muslim community. This is directed at everybody protesting. Yeah. This is Prevent 2 or the talk of Prevent 2, and they've now charged a former head of Ofsted. I mean, it it baffles me what a school inspector is going to do defining one of the hottest topics in contemporary world politics, what is extremism. Um, and, And we all know, because we've been through Prevent, this will not, even if they could come up with that definition, it will not be equally applied. You know, when um, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia in, comes to this country, who is responsible for chopping a journalist up into small parts and putting him in plastic bags, is that not extremism? Will he be challenged at the airport? I don't think he will. So we Those know where testing the, his arrival will likely well, be. Yeah, will much more likely yeah. be. So I mean, this is this is fundamental. So that's that's certainly one strand. It's obviously going to have an impact inside the Labour Party. I think it's already clear that what Iraq did to Tony Blair's reputation, Palestine is going to do to Keir Starmer's mm. a reputation. Where exactly that will end? There's road to run. Uh, there's a road to run there, um, and what it will mean electorally. Um, difficult to tell. You know, Blair had a lot of political capital to lose. Yes. And he lost it. Yes. Keir Starmer's got virtually none. Yeah. You know, he's had a 12-point decline in his personal ratings in a week yeah. because of this. Yeah. Ha- and, and coming to, 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 to the Labour Party slash movement, um, what, what's the position with trade unions? I mean, how do you, would you assess trade um, unions and where they stand right now? Well, I think we sometimes, those of us involved, sometimes look back and on the Iraq war and the, and the involvement of the trade unions and we kind of telescope the development. The truth of the matter was 
they were only partially present at the beginning and it was only the course of that where it became widely, not universally, but widely adopted an anti-war position inside inside the trade union movement. I think that's been eroded by the debates around um, uh, around Corbynism and eroded because of the reaction to the Ukraine war, which was, you know, for the anti-war movement was an isolated H- how moment. How so, if you would expand on this? Because I think, <clears throat> um, and I think this is one of the reasons why the establishment made a mistake about Palestine. They They got a huge wave of support for their position over... Um, over Ukraine, mm. you know, partly because they weren't fighting a war. Yes. You know, it, it was the perfect Boris Johnson war. <laughs> the Ukrainians were doing the fighting and dying, and he was, and he doing, was the, doing the, the propaganda. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it was, it was ideal yeah. Boris war, really. Um, so they got a sort of propaganda boost from that. Mm. And I think they thought what was going to happen was that this would be the same. They'd illuminate the buildings with the Israeli flag, everybody would cheer, the anti-war movement would be isolated, yeah. part two. And it just turned out so completely, such a complete misjudgment yeah. uh, on, that, uh, on that ground. And that's why you could hear after that first demonstration all the right-wing commentators and the Home Secretary on social media, and they can't get their heads around it now. They just cannot believe that this is a majority opinion that there are hundreds of thousands of people willing to go on the streets uh, about this. So I think it's going to be a shock to the political system on the scale that the Iraq war was and the consequences of it will unfold over a decade. Mm. And trade unions, do you think? I, I think that I think we'll win that battle, but I don't think we're there yeah. now. I think because of the Ukraine thing and because of the defeat of Corbynism, there's a lot of churn and... Um, and uncertainty among the unions. I think there's a right wing in the unions being led by Gary Smith, the General Secretary of the GMB, which has got a pro-defence industry and essentially pro-war positions through the last TUC. I think it'll take time to undo that. But we're in quite a strong position to begin with because um, the, peace, the, the Civil Servants Union, PCS, um, the fire brigades union, the RMT, some of the most powerful voices in the yeah. trade union movement are already there and on the demonstrations. Yeah. I mean, it's uplifting when you hear across um, across the European continent when you hear uh, the shipyard workers, for instance, in Belgium, refusing yeah. to uh, to load ships that are heading, you know, carrying probably weapons and technology and the such, taking it to Israel and the, and the like, and you and you get a sense. Um, that uh, you know the, the the trade union movement is is going to be essential to the defeat of the this this political savagery that, that we're seeing right now. I mean, um, the the mere fact that the governing party in the United Kingdom would actually move to sack one of its members for calling for an end to violence, calling for a ceasefire just tells you that we're in very, very awkward, very, very strange uh, political waters. Yeah. I, I mean, I think before this, uh, the Tories were absolutely finished. Yeah. And, 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 all, and, and now what's happening is that the COVID inquiry is reminding everybody yeah. in the same news bulletins yeah. that we're watching the news from Palestine. I have to say it's fascinating well, TV. Well, and, it's absolutely fascinating well, TV. I mean, it, 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 you know, you all, well, some of us, anyway, always thought that this was a bunch of self-entitled, yeah. privileged pu- public school boys who didn't know how to run a whelk stall. And guess what? There's the transcript proving it was worse than you could possibly have imagined. More chaotic, yeah. more internally and the divided. expensive, hundreds of thousands of lives. Well, I, I, you know, at the time... Untold damage to future generations. Yeah, I mean, watching that, you know, I mean, that was a homicidal government. You yeah. know, that is, just, just, that is just not an exaggeration to say that. When you walk along that COVID wall on the South Bank... Yeah. It's sickening, it really, really is. Yeah. And so I think they were finished. I think that finished them. Mm. Uh, Partygate finished them. Mm. Um, this, I mean, any sort of, I mean, it, it was always a weak and pathetic attempt to crawl out of the hole that Boris Johnson left them in the Sunak government. But this is going to ensure that that just never happens. So before we move on to what's happening in Palestine, 
Um, uh, the question that you know people ask me more than any other is that if we have a general election, you know, next month, next year, early next year, late next year, who do who do we vote for? Who do we go to? I mean, that 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 thing that I mentioned earlier, the fact that there are now millions of people up and down the country of all backgrounds who feel politically bereft, who feel politically, um, you know, orphans. Mm. They don't have a party whom they could turn to and feel that it, you know, it, they are represented thereby. Mm. Um, what, what, what would the answer be? Well, I think there's, there's kind of two answers to that question and I'm sure that millions of people in the electorate feel exactly like this. One answer is I would vote for a donkey if it got rid of the Tory government. <laughs> um, you know, my dad came from South Wales. This is what he always used to say to me. He said, um, if, if the Labour Party put up a donkey in an election with a Labour rosette on it, it would get elected. <laughs> and I think the not because they at all like Keir Starmer, yeah. but because they, and rightly, absolutely detest the Tory government, mm. that's going to happen in a large number of constituencies. Mm. I think as importantly, even though it will only be in a minority of constituencies, is there is going to be left of Labour candidates. Mm. Some of them won't be credible, but some of them will be. Mm. Jeremy is obviously, in my view, going to stand. Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah, he's going to stand. And I think that will be an absolutely signal battle. Mm. I mean, let's face it, as it stands, if we don't get Jeremy Corbyn back in the House of Commons, there is no anti-war voice yeah. in the House yeah. of Commons. Yeah. Um, but I don't think he'll be alone. And Keir Starmer, to be fair to him, is working hard to create a new left party. Mm. He is removing the whip. Yeah. Uh, the, the base of, of an, any electoral operation, as we all know, is the local councillors. They are leaving in droves. So it wouldn't surprise me if by the time we get to a, a general election, there are more credible, genuine left of Labour candidates mm. than looks likely at the moment. And even if a minority of those get elected, yeah. that will be a signal that Keir Starmer's on the very slipperiest of slopes. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, let's talk about what's happening, what's ha what has been happening now for twenty five days, thirty days, um, in Palestine, and uh, obviously we have been witness to the most horrific of scenes, um, and the world has has uh, has has seen um, a crime of immense proportions being committed. The fascinating um, and quite, uh, uh, quite tragic element of this is that it's happened with the backing of our government, the United States government, and of many governments across Europe and across the world who basically told Israel to do what it wanted to do. And... Um, uh, and, and that sort of adds to the, to, to the tragedy. I mean, for, to see a crime unfold is one thing, but then to see that those who claim democracy and human rights and freedoms and liberties and humanity side by the murderer or by the criminal is a totally different, different thing. Mm. And essentially, this is what we've seen. This is what we've witnessed. Yes, and, you know, I mean, for those of us that saw the invasion of Iraq, you know, this is how the major powers behave in the Middle East. This is how they govern that part of the world, and they do govern that part of the world. I mean, I think you have to understand the architecture of the region, the imperial architecture of the region. And the imperial architecture of the region is that uh, the Americans and their allies um, fund the Israeli state in order to keep down the Palestinians and more generally the Arab population of the region. And they simultaneously pay the tyrants and dictators of the Arab states not to attack the Israelis. That's how, that's how 
whatever passes for stability in the Middle East, mm. in the eyes of the imperial powers, is sustained. And the, the loss of life, generation after generation, the instance of the most bloody and horrific war, the fomentation of ethnic conflict, is a permanent condition mm. of that architecture. Mm. Um many would say <clears throat> that uh i mean actually i i, I get several messages um every every day almost uh, from people asking why it is that whilst we hold obviously our government and the u.s government and the israeli government of course uh, before all else uh, responsible why is it that we don't pile the same level of pressure and responsibility on the Arab regimes. Why is it that, for instance, our, I mean, this is a logistical issue, but why is it that we don't protest in front of the Saudi embassy or the Egyptian embassy or the mm. Jordanian embassy or the such? Um, and whilst the Palestinians are being killed, um, we have, you know, the, the deal of the century. We have normalization mm. with Israel, which uh, isn't by any stretch of the imagination to create peace. Uh, it's to, to further subjugate and, to, you know, to, to further dehumanize and deprive the Palestinians. Mm. Um, but it's, it's interesting what you say, and that is the kind of schism between the, 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 the governments and the people. Mm. Because <clears throat> the, uh, the outburst that I noted more than any other was the one in Morocco. Morocco is one of the signatories to the Abrahamic mm. Accords mm. and, you know, it, it's normalized with Israel. But when it seems that the regime felt that there was going to be an eruption, it sort of said, okay, fine, let's allow people a day. Mm. And three million people turned mm. up mm. and they absolutely filled, they paralyzed Rabat. Mm. Um, and that's, is essentially how people feel. Mm. You know, you have the Jordanians, for instance, en masse, hundreds, actually running, sprinting towards the borders. Yeah. yeah. You know, saying, let us in, let us help defend our Palestinian brothers. Um, this surely cannot be, it's not sustainable. No, exactly. And I think uh, this is, this was one of the great fears that the Americans had and one of the reasons why they, not to the extent of it actually being effective, but were counselling restraint uh, on the Israelis because they know that this is an absolute dynamite question right across the region. You know, it's, uh, you know, I, I agree about the Morocco demonstration, but uh, in many ways, because I was in Tahir Square during the um, Egyptian Revolution, what caught my eye was the fact that protesters got back into Tahir Square for the first time yeah. since the revolution. And the Sisi government, that is the last, the very last thing on earth yeah. that it wants to, uh, wants to see. It doesn't want to see, as happened I think a week before that, um, a policeman in one of the resorts taking out his gun and shooting uh, two Israeli tourists. Yeah. Yeah. Now... There was a there was an Egyptian president shot by his own army right. for making peace with the Israelis, and nobody, believe me, nobody in the El Sisi regime looks on those two things and doesn't think, "Ooh, yeah. this is dangerous for for us." Yeah. Um, and and of course, whether or not it's it's what will actually happen, but we know that one one plan for what might happen is forcing Gazans into the Sinai, yeah. where there, are, there is already an insurrection. There are already, they reckon, a thousand ISIS fighters. I mean, nobody in their right mind can think that pushing perhaps millions or certainly hundreds of thousands of very angry, mourning Palestinians into that environment is going to end well. It'll be just like Iraq. We'll create a second wave of jihadi uh, of jihadi terrorism. So, I mean, it is so it is so bad. You know the 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 ramifications of this that it barely you know barely can be thought through. I mean, 
you know, it didn't appear very, very long in the in the British press, but the Houthis fired yeah. cruise missiles yes. and 14 drones that had to be brought down by the USS Kearney in the Red Sea. Yeah. Now, that's a different order of any attack that's ever been mounted on uh, on Israel. And so that's, that's just three items that we've discussed, yeah. which any single one of which is an absolutely devastating development in the... In the in the region, I mean, and, they're, and they're doing this in a they aren't doing this in a pre Iraq war mm. environment. They're doing this in a post Iraq yeah. war yeah. environment, and that's a wholly different. It's scene. a totally different scene. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, I uh, I, I recall. I mean, you mentioned the uh, the revolution in Egypt. As someone who hails from an Arab background, I I know that there are a million issues upon which. Arab people differ, argue, fight, you know. Um, but there is one issue mm. upon which no one differs, and that is Palestine. Yeah. Now, I mean, I always say to people, in, in Cairo, every cab driver, every person you meet on the street, every waiter in a restaurant, every uh, person on a street corner, it's universal. Support of Palestine. It's it's like the NHS in this country. Yeah, there are very few people in this country who don't support the Absolutely. NHS, and there are very few people in Cairo in the Arab world generally that don't support the Absolutely. Palestinians. Absolutely. I mean, I recall uh, you mentioned the revolution. I recall just a few days after Mubarak was uh, deposed. Um, I remember the, you know, without call, without any kind of organization, a throng. Of, of protesters, they gather in front of the Israeli embassy, which happens to be in a high-rise building. And someone literally scales the building yeah. to bring down the Israeli flag. Now, this was not essentially part of the revolution. Mm. The revolution was in order to reform the state of power and the state of the, mm. the, the, the nation. But somehow, there were thousands of, of Egyptians who thought, you know what? Yeah. This also needs to be addressed. Yeah. So it was also it was as though the this is not a foreign policy. This is not something that is foreign. This is yeah. part and parcel of our national identity, of our national security. It's and therefore you you, you sort of think that how the regimes and how the powers that be uh, the the run the the Arab states and the kind of clash between their stands and the, the pent-up emotions, frustrations of the people, that surely <laughs> is something that, that, that can't be held back. Yeah, and, and you know, it, it's clear, you know, when you, when you read the more intelligent establishment commentators in the Financial Times and whatnot, they do understand, yeah. they do understand that this is entirely possible. It's, and it's, you know, in my political tradition, there's an, there's an old phrase that the, the road to Jerusalem runs through Cairo. And that, that's literally yeah. what we're watching. Yeah. And it's not, you know, at times that's an abstraction. Yeah. But it's not an abstraction now. Correct. It's not an abstraction because if they get away with that, plan if it ever gets implemented it will be literally the difference between completing a second nakba and not Absolutely. whether or not the egyptian state is under sufficient pressure to stop that happening it will be literally the case that whether or not this can continue depends on what the reaction in lebanon yeah. is and wider a field than that you you mentioned uh, the the scenarios being put forward uh, by the US, obviously, but also taken on board by um, actors uh, in the MENA region about the transfer of the people of Gaza, about um, several hundreds of thousands, if not nine on a million, being uh, driven into the Sinai Desert. Um, some, and by the way, I read somewhere that in exchange for all of Egypt's debts, yes, yeah to be relieved, which is, runs into several hundreds of billions. Um, Jordan, taken on board several hundreds of thousands. And fascinatingly, 
um, uh, Ambar province in Iraq, in Western Iraq, also mm. housing several hundreds of thousands, if not also probably nigh on a million Gazans. Um, you know, do you see that there is any any kind of uh, r truth to all of this? Do you think any of this will transpire, will happen? What do you think the impact will be? Not only because, as you put it, I mean, the Sinai Desert alone is a scenario for, 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 for catastrophe. So, um, so I mean, how, how what's your response when you read? The I think scenario? these are at the outer perimeter of even what the Israelis think is uh, is possible, not least because, as we saw with the Cairo Peace Conference, um, the Egyptian state completely understands how destabilizing that would be and is therefore fundamentally unwilling, uh, even with the level of bribe being offered to it yeah. to go uh, down there. I mean, it's not a lot of good having your debt paid off if suddenly you have a second eruption of the Egyptian revolution. So um, I, I think they're very mindful that this is an you know extraordinarily uh, dangerous uh, and disruptive thing to contemplate but the trouble is nobody seems to know um whether or not the israelis have any kind of end game here at all mm. and the fear of the americans is quite clearly that they do not mm. that they are just on a kind of revenge spree in uh, Gaza without any conception of what could possibly happen at the end of this. And that must be, that must be to a degree true because, you know, no plan is being announced. Even this kind of discussion that we're talking about at Sinai is happening kind of semi-secretly and in the margins of discussion. It's not really something that's being openly proclaimed. Um, and nothing is being openly proclaimed. Uh, Proclaimed. I mean, there are talks about partitioning North and South Gaza. How does that help? I mean, I, don't, I really don't see that that solves the uh, solves the problem. Um, they must surely understand that if you massacre this number of people in a population that has the age demographic yeah. that Gaza has, there are going to be people who hate you and will continue to hate you forever not just for this generation, forever, but for the next generation. Forever. So, you know, with certainty for 80 to 100 years. Yeah. So I, I don't, I don't, I literally cannot imagine where they think this is going. Um, I'd like to, uh, I mean, talk about the pioneers of, um, of this movement that started, you know, since South Africa. Mm you know, many decades ago. I mean, obviously we have a, amongst us still people like Jeremy Corbyn, um, but you know, people that we miss today, you know, people like Tony Benn, for mm. instance, people who are still amongst us, but sort of away from the scene a little bit, like Ken Livingston, mm. people like, you know, Ken Loach, mm. um, and, and, and many, many others, countless, mm. Diane Abbott, for mm. instance, you know, were real heroes who, you know, when, when you witness the, um, you know, the, the tremendous crowds that come out week upon week, um, you can't help but recall their input mm. and their, you know, their role in building all of this. Mm. You know, I, I remember those names uh, amongst many, many others um, during the Iraq time, you know, traveling up and down the country, speaking in small village halls, as well as in huge theaters and on stages, talking to, to hundreds of thousands of people. Um, this, this movement is something, something quite, quite historic. We thought at the time um, it was big, but the fact that we still, you know, 25 years on, I mean, the, the friend's house yeah. meeting, in late 2001, mm. so that's now almost two, yeah, 23 yeah. years, and going strong, apparently. Yeah. And no. the coalition, the, 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 you know, the kind of organizations from the Muslim Association of Britain to stop the war, to CND, to PSC, to, mm. you know, you have that array that represents all of, all of Britain. Yeah, and, you know, the, I mean, there always has been um, a strong 
anti-colonial, anti-imperialist tradition um, in the British Labour in the British Labour movement, in different strands and different formations. You know, uh, a, 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 a revolutionary left version of that, a, a communist tradition version of that, a, a Labour left version of that, a pacifist mm. version uh, version of that. Um, I, I think the 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 knack. Um, was to bring those strands together, yeah. uh, and to, and whatever differences of analysis or history uh, or wider politics there were, to to get an effective form of organised cooperation. That's what that's what did it. That there was a there was a sufficient degree of unity at the core of it to detonate a wider unity in the in the in the society. I think, um, and those. People you mentioned, you know, Tony Benn in particular, were were very, very important in in, in doing in doing that. Mm -hmm. it, it makes one proud to be to be part of it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you very much, John.